Good evening, everyone. Hi there. Wow, this is crazy. What's going on? Um, so this is uh, a fantasy of mine that it seemingly has finally come true. So I'm the youngest of six kids, um, Lat Lamarki, so the others were all two years apart. I was five years late, grew up in the church, so everyone could sing, play a musical instrument and so forth, and I am utterly hopeless. Tone deaf, can't read music to save my life, adore it, but hopeless. So the idea that I could be on stage at the orbit of all places, as you can imagine... Um, felt like, you know, one of my fantasies are coming true tonight. So thank you for being here. I'm sure you're a little bit surprised why I'm not Leon, the band. They will follow, I promise you. Um, but I have been asked by two amazing people, uh, Costas uh, and Kevin, who run the Science and Cocktails. Fantastic idea. How cool is that? Combined science and cocktails. Um, and they invited me to come and share some research findings uh, with, I guess, something that involves all of us, that implicates all of us, why it is that our cities remain as stubbornly divided as they are. So I will take you on a couple of different journeys. Part of it is historical, is to... Now, we're going to have some technical things. So I'm going to have to do this weird hip-hop thing where I'm going to, you know... Yes, and it will work. So I've got to just stay in the flow, and it will make the difference, hopefully. So I will take you on a bit of a journey to understand why it is that we're in this mess that we are in, in terms of the profoundly divided and segregated cities that we inhabit, and give you spend some time looking back to 94, actually 93, when we started to put in place the policy frameworks that was meant to solve the crisis that we continue to live. And then I will fast forward to now and give you a sense of what's the debates and the efforts and the money that is being spent in our big cities, particularly the eight metros, including Johannesburg, to try and resolve this question. And the last part of uh, my riff tonight will be to share with you a set of discussions that I've convened this year in Cape Town. So I brought together 30 people from diverse sectors in Cape Town to reflect on why Cape Town in particular, which I guess is emblematic of the apartheid city or the divided city, why it remains so profoundly divided. And I'll share with you a couple of propositions that we've just resolved. We will carry forward to the city at some public event next year. And we call this initiative the Integration Syndicate. So hopefully through that journey, you'll have a sense of the historical drivers, the contemporary market forces and public policy that causes the problems, and also get a sense that some of us are trying to think outside of the box about how to solve this question. So hip-hop move. There we go. It's working too fast. Okay. So what this slide depicts is... Um, the journey will be quick, and I'm available for Q&A afterwards and discussion. And essentially, this was the sort of wet dream of the apartheid planners, where you can perfectly segregate races in space, but not just races in terms of residential areas, but also functional areas. And if we go back to the earliest days of urbanism in South Africa, which was actually in Port Elizabeth, the first experiment with Location policy happened in Port Elizabeth, and it in fact was driven by the London Mission Society, where they figured out that if you build barracks for the working class, this is a way of both having labor available for the process of urbanization and industrialization, but at the same time keep them as far away as possible, of course, from the civilized settler population. And this pretty much became the template for urbanism over the last 160, 70 years. We then had, of course, after the Union, the Native Land Act, which resolved that the indigenous populations could only occupy 13% of the land mass in designated tribal areas, which was followed up in 1923 with the Native Urban Areas Act, which in a sense was really the moment in which our cities were functionally and racially segregated. 
And when Favut and company came into power in 1948, the table was already laid. So the problem is not one of apartheid. It is about apartheid working with a template and then enacting a whole set of laws to regulate social, cultural, political, and economic life through a series of acts to create what we had by 1994. And one of the most important uh, uh, sort of geographers in South Africa that have been tracing these processes came to this conclusion in 2001. And he argued, I quote, by the early 1990s, remarkably few urban dwellers had lived even a part of their adult lives in racially or ethnically integrated conditions. There is no other social engineering experiment in the world outside of the sort of Soviet bloc that have been able to achieve this measure of regulation. Okay, there we go, too fast. So when 94 rolled around, and in fact we should say 1990 when the transition process happened, all kinds of policy intentions were laid. And I found this fascinating quote which happened in the National Housing Forum. And I want you to quickly squiz over it. And essentially, we could have written this last week. This was in the National Housing Forum, which was one of the chambers that fed into CODESA and trying to anticipate what the new local government structure was going to look like and what we needed to do in terms of urban development policy. And as you can see, all the keywords are there. Higher density, new areas, reintegrate fragmented parts. We need to focus on public transport systems. We need to ensure there's a higher degree of mix of land uses. And again, we need to focus on public transport. 1993, right? So we've kind of had the answer all along. This then translated into the RDP, the manifesto of the ANC, and there's this absolutely clear quote, the need to break down apartheid geography through land reform, more compact cities, decent public transport, and the development of industries and services that use local resources or meet local needs as the key to overcome the legacy of apartheid. 1994. So what the RDP and so forth set in train then was a massive legislative reform program around housing, household services, urban infrastructure, and the democratization of local government. Okay, F focus here. Don't worry about the detail. The point about this is that even though we simultaneously decided to massively ramp up investment in public infrastructure, the centerpiece of this was housing policy, and everything else would follow in its wake. Okay, so my... Okay, so um, what I want to sort of very quickly refer you to is just the scope and scale of the crisis. And so since 94, South Africa boasts the fact that it has one of the largest public housing programs. In fact, if anyone has read The Guardian in the last couple of days, you will see that Mexico has actually had a program twice as large as ours over the last 10 years. But the point about this is that even though we've been able to process over 4 million subsidies, build maybe somewhere in the vicinity of 2.8 to 3.5 million actual units. All that has done is to exacerbate the spatial form problem of apartheid. And in fact, fragmentation, segregation, and spatial inequality today is arguably worse than it was in 1994. So, in response, of course, what we do as policy wonks like myself, and there's some others in the room, is we write policy to fix these things. So the new growth path was going to kind of get us out of the economic slump. This was followed on with the National Development Plan, and Chapter 8 of the National Development Plan, again, provides a brilliant exegesis of why it is our cities are in the mess that they found themselves and in response to that, there's been a whole series of reforms that the government is trying to enact at the moment to fix this problem. Spatial uh, legislation, SPLUMA, came out in, 19, in 2015. Uh, since 2005, this is a sort of interesting anomaly in South Africa. We, one of the things the constitution writers got wrong was they didn't quite understand how you invest in and how you reproduce cities. So if you look at all the key functions that deal with the urban, housing, transport, etc., 
they are awkwardly split across the three spheres of government. Neither provincial government, nor local government, nor national department can resolve any of these things because they don't have all of the functions available to them. So in 2004-05, there was a review of the constitutional distribution of powers and functions like uh, housing, transport, and so on. Until today, Cabinet, as the Department of Local Government, has been unable to implement any of the recommendations in that review. Okay, so just sort of one illustration. But what I want to draw your attention to is something in red there called the City Support Program. And I'll say a little bit more about later, but just keep that in mind. But so all I want you to know for now is that government is busy. They're doing all kinds of things, and many, many people are working in different ways on all of these things simultaneously. Okay, whether it's taking us anywhere, we'll assess that as we proceed. Sorry, I've got a human remote, and uh, so um, it was sleeping on the job there. Um, maybe it's kind of that, you know, that list of things government is busy with will have that effect on anyone. All good, Kevin. So in 2016, government released this document, and um, it's called the Integrated Urban Development Framework. And what it is, is an attempt by national government to, in a way, go into therapy. So what it's done is it's reflected on why it is it can't solve this urban problem. And in this document, it speaks to itself, a little bit like a mad person or any one of us in the shower in the morning. And what it says to itself is, I'm confused. I act in a contradictory way. And across my spheres of government, the one hand doesn't know what the other is doing. And let's get our shit together. Okay, That's what that policy says. Obviously, in slightly more elegant and boring policy language, but that's the bottom line of what it says. And essentially, um, of course, it is not being implemented, right? And we can come back to that question about why we are so incredibly good at producing eloquent policies that, in a sense, go absolutely nowhere except add to the noise in the system. But it does come to this conclusion as well. So at the heart of that policy, and I just want you to sort of have this image in your head as we proceed, is this idea that the way we can solve this is not necessarily more policy, but understanding that every rand that gets spent on public transport, housing, land reform, whatever it might be, you have to think about the return on investment on that land in terms of the economy, people, and placemaking. And I think this sort of core idea about what is the urban dividend, what, what are you able to achieve if lots of us live together, lots of innovation is agglomerated, and you're able potentially to catalyze amazing things, right? And that's what the policy asks it's of itself and the state to think about when it spends uh, a rand, okay? Now, whether that's happening or not, of course, is another story. Now, I did not have this picture up just to have a vicarious excuse uh, to have uh, our president uh, do his fantastic spec maneuver, um, charming as it is. But the point that I want to sort of leave with you is this quote here. He spoke to all the local authorities here in April of this year, and he said, a municipality's objective must also be to turn the tide against the current spatial patterns of apartheid in the next 5 to 15 years, though better and through better and coordinated land use management, ensuring the new built environment and inclusive spatial landscape and inclusive spatial landscape emerges across the country. Sorry, I did a bit of a zoomer there in how I read that. Sorry, that wasn't intentional. That was just bad reading on my part. Um, But as you can see, it's deja vu. We're back to 93. We're saying exactly the same thing as uh, 24 years ago. So in response, remember the city support program? So basically what that was was the big kid on the block, National Treasury, so, you know, of all the government departments are equal, but some are more equal than others. And the one department that is definitely more equal than others is National Treasury. So in 2013, they kind of got hurtful. 
basically. They realize we've been talking this stuff for years. Housing ain't going to get their shit together. Transport ain't going to get their shit together. Sorry, I'm in a jazz club, so I'm allowed to swear. I'm pretty sure that that's part of science and cocktails, right? So um, they're not going to get their shit together. So what they said was, why? what happens if we take a pot of money, we ring fence it, and we dangle it in front of the eight big cities in South Africa, and we say, if you are going to identify really serious sites in space, actual parcels of land where you are going to pursue transformation, we will give you, we will spot you a couple of billion. It's called the City Support Program. But you had to produce a fantastic acronym, BEP. You had to produce a BEP, not a BOOP, a BEP. And the BEP is Built Environment Performance Plan and sort of trust government departments to, of course, you know, come up with innovative uh, language to, to explain what they want. At least they're literal. And essentially what this plan does, it forces every one of the eight metros in South Africa to, on an annual basis, provide an analysis about the apartheid city, why it's reproducing itself, and what they will do to transform that. How are they doing this? And I want to use Cape Town as a reference point because it helps us to anchor what is a broader concept. But this is going on in all eight of the metros in South Africa, including Johannesburg. So it uses this analytical frame. It says, if you're going to transform a city, you need to allow the Herman Mashabas, the Patricia de Lilles of the world, to have a vision, to sell that narrative to the population, to say, this is how I'm going to give expression to my manifesto. That's the top 2, 3, 4% of the budget. Inspire through symbolic actions. Now, of course, um, I think the memo didn't always go out to the right sort of point in Mayor Mashaba's office, so his symbolic actions were somewhat misplaced, and he kind of got the wrong end of the stick a couple of times in the last year. But, you know, he was out there trying to um, accuse all kinds of hardworking people of not belonging and not having a place in our city. The second aspect, which is the core of it and where the bulk is, is is the argument that if you improve the mobility in the city, if you can get public transport to work, rear via, bus rapid transit systems, then you are able to shift the logics of how people move, how industry is located, and what's going on. So the money for the BRTs comes largely from this, but the idea is that you can't just have BRT. You need to crowd in investment for industry, manufacturing, services, and very, very importantly, social housing. You need cultural density of a new class of citizen that wants to have a different urban experience as opposed to the traditional township or suburban experience, who wants to foster a different way of being in the city and making the city Now, none of that can work, of course, if the potholes are there, the traffic lights are not working, and you're not getting water and sanitation to everyone. So it's not an either-or, but it is about a hierarchy. And the BEPs basically set out in meticulous detail how each of the metros interpret this and apply this in their cities. So things have shifted. There are new things on the table. There are new things to be engaged with. The citizen oversight... The civil society engagement, not so great. In part, because of the sense of deja vu. We've heard all of this before. You've been saying it for 25 years. But actually, in these documents, there's some new and different things. And it's worth paying attention to. So the basic logic... ...of these processes is that we've got kind of two cities that hardly overlap. We've got where all of us live, in the suburbs, elite city, and then where the majority of urban residents live in the townships. And what the BEP is meant to do is to grow that zone of overlap, the mixed city, the new post-apartheid city is meant to emerge there gloriously. Now, in Cape Town, this is how they visualize that. I don't know how many of you have any visual or spatial sense of Cape Town, Um, But essentially, that's the central business district. Uh, The waterfront is there. 
the airport is over here. The sort of main township areas are over here. This is the public transport network. And what the city has decided in its BEP, um, can you click for me, please, um, is to identify these five nodes to anchor and focus their investments. Uh, this is Philippi. Uh, that's Belleville. And then continue. The provincial government then overlays, continue. And then they've just purchased this parcel of land, which is a no man's slice of land between Kailicho and Mitchell's Plain, just next to the airport. Continue. And then there's a whole set of housing interventions. And then they've identified, uh, and last one, these three zones of integration in the city. So I don't have time to get into the detail of it, but all I want you to kind of grasp from this is that there is indeed an attempt to understand the space economy of our different cities and to target investments over the next 15, 20, 30 years to activate these spaces in a way that you can reorder the logic. So, for example, this represents a new rail corridor between Kailicha and Belleville. Now, all the mobility in Cape Town goes to the center and goes out. Highly inefficient and obviously reproduces the spatial form of the city. And this can potentially dramatically reorient the look-feel sensibility of the city. Um, now, what the city then does is that translates into whole logic for investment, and then they come up with pretty pictures like this. So this is the Philippine node, where they kind of, the artists or architecture impressions run wild. And so at the moment, there's basically just informal settlements around here, and they're imagining that this TOD site will become the epicenter of, of course, the obligatory shopping mall. Um, how can we possibly have a future without a shopping mall? Um, swimming pool, uh, mixed residential stock, and then at a street scale, it's kind of this kind of fabric. So again, in question time, I'm very happy to comment on the assumptions behind this. But there's again a dissonance between the kind of imagination that is allowed to run wild that is completely delinked from the realities on the ground in these places. And in some ways, a really important opportunity about focusing investments in our cities is being lost in the hubris of planners and, to some extent, designers who have no interest in working with the grain of the city as it exists. So the question we then ask is, can TOD transit-oriented development, the BRT systems, can it save Cape Town? Can it overcome that kind of spatial condition? So a couple of remarks to, to make. One is this is the income distribution of households in Cape Town, and what this plot graph shows you is the average incomes of African black communities, African colored, and that's white households. So what that reflects there is what's happened to the real estate market in Cape Town over the last 15, 20 years. So the main source of asset wealth for households is property. And despite sluggish the economy overall, property prices have gone through the roof. And so in that asset class, we've seen an exacerbation of income distribution and inequality in racial terms in Cape Town. And of course... The reality is that the vast majority of Cape Townians rely on public housing and a very small proportion qualify for the mortgage market. And then there's a huge working middle that don't have access to any of those instruments. So this is the labor market structure of Cape Town and the economic sectors. And what you see here basically is that on this axis, it shows you the labor intensity. And only hotels and retail generate jobs. Okay, so that's the year-on-year -year tourism growth. Um, this is financial services, our largest economic sector, but it has negative employment consequences. So, you, so this is the structural problem that you, we sit with in, in Cape Town. So unsurprisingly, unemployment is rife, inequality is enormous, and people, most residents, are trapped in these spatial, uh, spatially determined areas of, of multiple deprivation. So what this shows you, the red uh, sort of troughs is residential density. So this is where people live in very, very dense conditions. Those are informal settlements, and there and there, not that obviously. Um, and that's employment density. So you can see the problem. So if you live here, 
you simply cannot afford the 50 rand public transport cost that it will require to go look for work on that end of the city. So what has happened? This is what the state has invested its money in over the last 15 years. It's tried to focus all of its investments where the poor live, public housing, infrastructure, and so forth. And, of course, this got the market excited, and so they reinforced that. Kidding, just joking, not. They went in the opposite direction. Okay, you see, I knew there was something to this cocktails and signs business. How fantastic is that? How fantastic is that? Thank you, sir. And it's smoking. (laughs) That is cool. So, of course, in this context, it is impossible to create the economic logics that can facilitate inclusion because the market forces are much more profound on the back of that real estate growth and property market that I mentioned to you earlier. Okay. So to then start to to sort of turn to how we respond to this. So since the beginning of the year, we've used this wonderful space at Aid for Arts Foundation in Cape Town. And once a month for four hours, we get together as a collective and we reflect on these questions in Cape Town. And we called it the Integration Syndicate because in Cape Town you can't have collectives who don't deem themselves a syndicate um, because you kind of will have no street cred. And... um, And we try to really wrestle with these questions in a really open-ended way and trying to build also a shared language. And so we developed through this process some, in a way, our own analysis. And the first point we thought was important to state is that, yes, the city support program is great. Yes, the built environment performance plan is a step forward. Yes, it is important to invest in public transport and try and crowd in new categories of real estate But really, are you going to change? Are you going to rely on the real estate market as your primary instrument to transform the city? Is that, how can that possibly be good enough, right? How could that be the sum total of all of our intelligence and research and work over the last 25 years? And so we're trying to reframe the problem so that it's not one that is just about spatial determinism but it is rather something that confronts these four factors, which we believe is at the core of what we need to address. One is this economic duality. You have to, have to, have to think jobs. You cannot possibly resolve this question without going to the core of labor market incorporation. You've got to understand what it means when there's no class or social mobility for people. When you're born black in a township, you ain't going nowhere, right? What does that mean? Individually, culturally, politically, what does that mean? How do we build a language that can confront that fact? Thirdly, we are in profound environmental crisis. Our growth model is obsolete. It is extractive. And as the drought is teaching us at the moment, we are heading in completely the wrong direction in terms of the built form and the way we've structured the economy and what we value. And finally, we have no clue how to talk to each other. We have no clue how to make sense of who we are 25 years later, given this background. We are culturally unhandig. We are awkward, stunted, inarticulate. And as a result... We are incapable of infusing various processes with a kind of community-driven, grassroots-driven energy that is what is what is required to change this. So sort of in a systems way, and this is my nod to the scientists in the room, um, you know, as social scientists, we've got a massive inferiority complex, so we always kind of have to do these things to pretend we're also real scientists, you know. But uh, so here's a little systems diagram, and it gives me a chance to have my cocktail. Because I'm pretty sure Einstein didn't have all of his inventions just by sheer hard work. Um, 
So what this basically kind of focuses attention on is this idea of what drives the stunted social mobility. And we believe that it's really important to pay attention to the fact that the sort of spatial ghettoization manifests in this crisis of meaning that I've just referenced. And so we've got to go to culture and the arts. We've got to go there. Furthermore, we've got to recognize that in the larger zeitgeist of the time, of the moment, we just don't have 15, 20, 30 more years to deal with this stuff, right? And interestingly enough, it's not just cultural, it's not just economic dualities. So one of the key sites for Transformation Cape Town is a really, really fascinating node uh, which is the only little bit of Cape Town that's like Joburg. It's Belleville. Uh, so in Belleville, so you know, say so if you want kind of to breathe a bit of African air, you go to Belleville. That's how you, that's how you do it in Cape Town. And in Belleville, when I walked there for, for two days to kind of speak to people and traders on the street and get a sense of the place because it's one of the priority nodes, is this was the main aesthetic statement that I saw everywhere. People in Belleville have an obsession with gold teeth. Okay? All shapes, the grill has got to glow. So, isn't it interesting, at the same time as I was doing that walk, all the sort of fantastic excitement about Zeitz Mocha, right? And this is Cape Town. This is our cities. It is these worlds that are culturally so profoundly different and apart. And it is in that contradiction, in that clash, that we are as planners, as urbanists and so forth, found wanting. We don't have an imagination or a language to deal with the real city in all of its cultural complexities and entanglements. We just don't. And so we move between these worlds, hoping that somehow, magically, some form of some of sort of cross-pollination will occur. So with that in mind, five propositions. But to kind of, for them to make sense, the first step is to recognize that we've got to learn to re-look, re-see our cities and not obsess so much about these TOD nodes, as the planners call them. And I promise you, planners have whole conferences for days on end, about TOD nodes. It's a real thing. Um, so this shows you kind of the, the, the spectrum of settlement types. Suburbia, with the sort of CBDs in, encased in that. So things Santon, Rosebank, and so forth. Transition zones, we're in one now. I think Bromfontein is a kind of interesting transition zone. Township condition of which informal settlements is generally between 20 and 25% in most South African cities. And then, of course, lots of backyard shacks in almost all of the township housing. And then the new public housing, which is an extension of that built form. And the idea, of course, is that our transit-oriented development will kind of knit together these spaces, Rio Vaya, and so forth. So clearly, as a set of principles, it's really important to think about how we intensify connections across these. And I will come back to it in rather frightening ways when I pre present some of our proposals. Secondly, how do we consolidate blend uses and typologies? And that's just so that I can sound informed to the planners and architects. Architects love the word typology. Um, so there's quite a few in the room tonight. So if you overhear typology at the bar, it's an architect. Regrow urban tissue through cultural confrontation and exchange. And finally, underwrite these imperatives with thinking the sustainability question seriously. In cultural terms, but seriously. We have to confront the sustainability question. So, first proposition. In Cape Town, we're going to spend 6 to 18 billion over the next 14 years on the BRT system. I'll repeat that. We'll spend six to 16 to 18 billion over the next 14 years on the BRT system. And it is totally and utterly unviable. We can't do it. We can't afford it. We just can't because you need 80 people per hectare for it to be viable and to break even. The average density of Cape Town, 25. 
So we're never going to get there. Even if Pam Golding goes ballistic, we're never going to get there. Okay? Not going to happen. But the census data tells us every South African in a city is maximum within 15 minutes walk to a minibus taxi. Now, anywhere in the world, a 15-minute walk to public transport is a, is a solved public transport. The problem is it doesn't fit our modern imagination about public transport because, right, we all hate them with a passion, right? We kind of want to pull out our AKs, dust them off, oil them, and, you know, go to work. So I get it, understand it, but the point is they've solved it organically, and it's the only 100% black-owned business in South Africa. Only, right? So why don't we Uberize them? Take a little bit of the subsidy money, get them to say, we're going to retain our market share, we will double it in the next 15 years, and in return, cash us out of the system and we'll do electronic money. Then you can install sensors. They can work in the off-peak hours, competing with DHL, take kids to school, do all kinds of stuff. Can you imagine how they can sweat their assets if you have an Uberized platform for these minibus taxis? So why wouldn't we stop wasting money on a technology that makes no sense in our urban form and rather invest in the solution that has organically emerged? That's the first proposition. I won't go through the detail. The second proposition is stop sprawl. No more public housing that will exacerbate sprawl. In Cape Town, we've calculated. You know, we've got this pathology because of apartheid planning standards from the 1950s. Every public school has this impossibly large public space because there needs to be a rugby field and there needs to be a soccer field and a netball field, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, the money for those things have dried up decades ago, but the fields are still there. How do we protect these spaces? We put up 12-foot fences, electric wire, and yet by the end of January every year in every province, the maintenance budget of provincial governments are spent because of vandalism over the holiday. So why don't we take the fences down, build two- to three-story walk-ups on that green space, build community, put in early childhood development creches, laundromats, repair shops, etc., put older people on the ground floor, you all can walk up, and we can, in Cape Town alone, absorb 55,000 units just on public school land in the city. Just public school land, right? No private schools, no Model C schools, just like real public schools, the ghetto schools, right? That's just, that's Cape Town, 55,000. That's 10 years' worth of public housing. So make the moratorium for a decade. Who cares? But it gets more beautiful, and this is the scary bit. We've worked it out. Actually, what's easier is all those little green spaces where you live. In the suburbs, we've got too many green spaces, little pockets which we can't maintain. Rather, aggregate them into a couple of really good parks and put the same typology where your domestic worker, the security guard, can live within the suburb. How cool is that, right? And it will solve the problem because the city can't manage all of those green spaces, and your staff, your workers, can now put their kids through school. They can save. They can take out a mortgage because they're not spending 50% of their disposable income on getting to work, right? So that's the second option. Thirdly, we can also insist that Pam Golding has every, 30% of all of her new developments. Sorry, I don't know why I'm picking on Pam. I think it's that terrible ad. I'm Pam Golding. I'm Pam Golding. I mean, my God, who was the copywriter for that ad? Kill him already. Where's my AK? Anyway, but you know what I mean. So Pam Golding, why would we not insist, as they do in London, as they do in most U.S. cities, in Singapore, everywhere in the world, that 30% of all private developments has to be affordable housing. Like, it's a no-brainer. We're not doing it. We've been talking about it for 10, 15 years. And what's really important here is that if you do the infill public housing, then the big guys can't do it. They can't make money. So actually, only the small black contractors can build in the smaller scale way.
So not only are we rebuilding the fabric of our city through public housing investment, we're also growing black business in these infill developments. Lastly, a fantastic project in Cape Town. Like, this is the coolest thing. The Working for Fire project is building a prototype to recycle the aliens into a material for shack construction that is fire resistant and allows for more formalized ways of structuring shacks. It's, the, uh, it's this close to being commercialized. But the point about that is that if 20 to 25% of our most vulnerable citizens live in these conditions, what about the back end there of that construction business? How do we begin to formalize it? So if you all look at Latin America or Asia, the way in which they were able to consolidate their cities, poor people into the city, is by creating very simple, minimalist standards for informal settlement construction, which allows you to go up and it allows you to consolidate and you build an asset. Again, not rocket science, pardon the pun, uh, hosts. The third issue that I won't get into now, um, but is this question of the majority of our urban citizens, the youth, is how do we think much more ambitiously about cultural programming to enable young people to have different and novel and important conversations about who they are, what our cities are, who it's for, and what it might become. And again, quite a few ideas about how to activate that, and I'll just... Okay. Which I won't go into now, but the key idea here is to really engage the public schooling system to enable that. Did you know? I don't know if you know that. I'm sure all your kids are in Model C schools. In public schools, they've stopped teaching art. Did you know this? Like in only one every 30 or 40 schools, do they teach art? I mean, when I went to a public school, and of course it was terrible, but at least, you know, you had a crayon and a piece of paper. So they've stopped teaching art. I mean, how crazy is that for a $16,000 per capita society that we stop teaching art or music in public schools? Insane, right? The fourth area is a little bit sort of specific uh, for people in the development space, but it's just, again, we enroll about two to 300,000 people a year in South Africa in community works programs. It's all the people with the overalls. Sometimes in Cape Town, uh, they somehow manage to put Jesus saves on the overalls as well. I don't know how that works. It's like a mystery. Whoever was driven in Cape Town, see EPWP workers and Jesus saves on the thing. It's like, you know, anyway... Beside the point, not very scientific. Um, so, yeah, the, this, these, these resources, this labor, people engaged or unemployed and looking for pathways to work, all that money could be redirected in a way that we can begin to what we call in planning jargon, we can think about placemaking. If you focus on public space, green infrastructure, restoring ecosystem services, and you reorient these programs to work with local communities to figure out how do you generate safety, how do you improve public space, et cetera, et cetera, you can have a massive spatial impact in terms of the quality of life. Now, the point about all this stuff is that integration is not going to come from the TOD node alone. Integration will come when where the majority of people live, the places where they live, the schools, the businesses transform. That's when integration will happen, when the townships become desirable places for all of us to want to live. And then finally, and this is just because Cape Town has got lots of techies and design people and uh, lots of you know, really wonderful liberals uh, who want to do good, but they don't know how. So the idea is simply to create an app where people can bank time, they can bank skills, they can bank all kinds of resources that they have to invest that in various grassroots organizations across the city. So we're speaking to a whole bunch of people on how that can work, but it gives you a basic idea. And how do you like my fractal diagram? Okay, I'm like, I'm trying to build a bridge here with, you know, the, phys the physicists. Same summary. And my cocktail is not finished. Um, I, I hope that this sort of journey across 
sort of, in a way, what feels like Groundhog Day in policy and legal terms. We kind of have the same conversation over and over. Is that I want you to take away these three things. One, urban divisions are indeed hardwired into the built and cultural fabric of our cities and are continuously reinforced by that routine process of investment by the private and public sector. Secondly, we can't afford to only focus on these so-called nodes. We need action in all settlement types, and we then need to connect these through cultural webbing. I've given you some ideas what that could be. Places like this, in other incarnations, is absolutely the key. Thirdly, urban integration cannot be delivered without a shared narrative that can cohere and focus diverse actors in the city. And what we are hoping in our small way in Cape Town, as academics, as activists, as public policy officers, private sector people, is to say, here's one narrative, and I've given you a sense of what that might be, to enable, hopefully, in Cape Town, I know Cape Town, but in Cape Town, hopefully a different kind of conversation and a different set of possibilities. And I hope that this gives you some sense of why it is that we are mired in the conditions that we are and that it is possible um, to think our way through that. Thank you. It's really good. All right. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of questions, so let's uh, let's take some questions. If there's one in front, okay, this is going to be tricky. Thank you so much. That was a very cool um, presentation. Um, my name is Lavlin, and I used to live in Cape Town as well, so I can relate uh, to a lot of what you're talking about. The question I wanted to ask was about these transition zones. I'm interested to know how do you differentiate between transition zones and places that are actually just gentrifying and pushing out black people um, and bringing in white people and increasing property prices. So just what's that differentiation? And when I say that, I'm thinking of your Bramfonteins, your Mabonings, in Cape Town, your Woodstocks, places like that. What, what is objective, what we actually want? Sure. Good. So uh, I had a little bit with someone how long it will take for gentrification to come up as a question. So you win the prize. Um, should I take more? Can I must I respond? Okay. So, so I'm going to be totally controversial. Um, I don't think we have enough gentrification as a start. Okay. So why do I say that? So firstly, cities, when they are dynamic, when they grow and develop, they are places where particularly young people and young entrepreneurs and young innovators are able to kind of run riot a little bit. They create new things. And those new things generate a kind of an energy that has a magnetic quality to it. What gentrification is symptomatic of is a small sliver of some of those people getting their, getting their game on. The problem is that we really, really, actually, if you look at our built environment, uh, if I think of Cape Town, Woodstock, Salt River, Maitland, etc., we've got unbelievable industrial space. Joburg is the same. You've got probably 10 times more than us. Why we don't have more recycling and conversion is a bit of a mystery to me. So I'll give you one stat. We add only 1% to the, from the private sector to the built stock on an annual basis. Just 1%. We add 2% from public money. Now, there's no way you can solve this problem by building differently new things. So the, the, the key is recycling. We've got to recycle our cities, our built environment, and so forth. Now, what we see in Mabuneng and in Woodstock um, is, in a way, a kind of market-driven process that has no regulatory frame. There's no vision about how do you allow innovation to happen but mitigate the fallout from that. The problem is it's very difficult to mitigate when actually Mabuneng is tiny. It's like, it's tiny. Woodstock is like tiny. We are 4 million people in Cape Town. The middle class is really significant. Joburg, 
I mean, in the larger conurbation with Tswane and Kuruleni, there's 13 million of you. Why is Mabuneng so small? Do you get my point? So, the point is that we shouldn't use gentrification as a scare word. We should really try and understand why it is that we don't see more entrepreneurial activity in the built environment. And then ask, if we can stimulate that, generate that, are there ways in which we can then ensure that displacement is not totally avoided because you can't achieve that, that's not possible, in the very logic of how cities reproduce themselves, there's always uneven development and displacement, but you can absolutely manage it in a much more effective way. And so you do need to have minimum quotas for inclusionary housing. You do need to have rent control. You do need to have rental opportunities for very poor families in very close proximity to where Mabuneng is. You need all of that stuff. But it needs a framework and it needs a clear-sighted policy agenda on how those things can work together. And I'm absolutely convinced they can work together. And in fact, if we get that formula right, we will see a dramatic explosion of investment because we've got unbelievable built stock in this country. We've got amazing entrepreneurs. There's lots of pent-up capital. But what we have is a failure of regulation and vision. And so we see really pathetic, I really think Mabuneng is pathetic in scale. It's really small. Um, I don't know if there's Mabuneng people here, but I mean, just, you know, <laughs> whatever. But And Woodstock is, I mean, it's basically the biscuit mill and whatever. I mean, it's, and it's so boring because it is one hipster typology after the next. <laughs> That's all it is, right? It is utterly boring. So, you know, I mean, you can get great cheese, but, you know, beyond that, and amazing gin and craft beer, but, I mean, my God, you know, is that really the best we can do? No. So, so I really think we should kind of park the gentrification issue and say, how do we get a lot more dynamism in the system but create a much wider band of inclusion in these renewal zones? Uh, and that we haven't yet figured out to do, in my view. More questions? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hi. I'm, I'm behind you. Yeah, okay, hi. <laughs> um, I lived in Singapore for six years before moving back to Cape Town um, and have been here for a year now. One of the things I learned living in Singapore was, was how you could really make high-density living work and how you could make high-density living work in without feeling like you were in the middle of um, – in, in, in a high-density living environment. I'll admit it's not Hong Kong. Um, my apartment in Singapore, I really could swing a cat and I couldn't touch the ceilings. Um, what what I really struggle with is, and I've spoken to a number of developers in Cape Town who also, the, the city is anti-high development. Um, people don't like high development. People want, and you look in Cape Town, you look at Parklands, you look at the urban sprawl that's happening out um, up the west coast of Cape Town. And I just, I mean, when I drive out there, it just grows bigger every time. Um, and um, why aren't we... And then they complain about the traffic. There are only two roads from that area into the city, which is where the jobs are, which is what the problem is, for those of you who don't know Cape Town. Um, and also in Joburg, it's... You know, you have Santon here, and you look out from a rooftop on Santon onto this suburbia sprawl. There's no high density. And the developers in Cape Town... Sorry, I'll go back to the original point complain that um, the council just won't allow building up. Okay. Um, Why aren't we doing more sure. building up? Sorry. Yeah, a complicated issue. So, I mean, different factors. So one is um, the one sort of anomaly in Cape Town is um, Century City. So Century City is the largest private real estate commercial development in Cape Town in the last 20 years. And, um, and I mean, it's pretty horrid. But, um, you know, um, 
it kind of does medium density fairly well, and it's made it attractive and appealing. So eight-story, 12-story, 14-story apartment blocks and so forth. So, so, so it's not entirely true that it's not happening at all. That's been a big chunk of the real estate development. I do get your point. So on the permission side, um, of course, the council is very sensitive to, um, to ratepayer associations and to the sentiments in ratepayer associations. Um, but I think that a lot of the developers are not targeting the right areas. So if you look at Fortrecker Road, if you look at Maitland, if you look at a whole bunch of semi-industrial areas that would be that has already got the bulk infrastructure to carry much higher density development, you can do really innovative things there. But I think the problem is that on the developer side is that they've got the century city typology in mind. There's that word again, architecture Teresh. Um, um, and if you look at the city that they can't imagine themselves. For them, high density is if you do a subdivision in the suburb and you go from a 1,200-square-meter house to eight duplexes on that property. I mean, that's like, oh, skanda, right? Oh, my God, there is high density in the suburb. So for them, that's politically risky. So, so, but I think we creating, you've got, so you've got Canal Walk and you've got Sea Point. What is Sea Point, right? So, I mean, so, so, so the point is what I'm saying is that there are ways in which we can approach this, but I think the entry point has to be a different market segment. So if you look at working people in that middle band that I showed earlier who live in a backyard shack in the township, but they have a decent job, they've got a reasonable income, they can't find rental accommodation in Cape Town for love or money. And so the trick is to shift private and public perception by bringing onto market a set of products in these industrial zones, well located in terms of public transport, and actually a really wonderful urban fabric. Um, you know, it's a Budavos curtain kind of aesthetic, but, you know, actually quite a nice urban fabric, which have been Africanized in an amazing way by migrants in the last decade. You can do some really fantastic things. The problem is that in the city and in the, there's no institution that can do the intermediation between the public sector, investors, and developers. And if you don't have actors who can intermediate to bring certain products to market, they will never happen. Everyone will talk about them, but they will never happen. And in Cape Town, I can tell you with 110% certainty that that's the core problem. We don't have an intermediating institution that would be similar to JDA in Joburg, but with a capital base. Um, and that's a core part of the problem. All right, there's a question here on the right. Yeah. Um, thank you, that was a lovely speech. Um, so my question is relating to high-density development. Um, how one circumvents existing patterns of ownership um, to, to make high-density high housing development in those areas, uh, close to uh, places of employment and such, um, and whether this can't be or can be done uh, with simple mediation between the public and private sector, or whether it requires a more systemic change in how we view property law. So, um, on the property law side, I'm, you know, I don't know enough to, to answer that aspect of the question. But I think that you get systemic change by doing precedent-setting interventions. That systemic change never arrives out of nowhere. It is once there is a cultural adjustment because people see alternatives and they can experience it. And so for me, the, the, the trigger to unlock that category of built environment stock are initiatives that are co-sponsored and that are intermediated. So it does require, though, that we reform the subsidy regimes and that we rethink the social housing institutions to enable that. But at the core of that, we have to understand that people who are just getting into the property market, who've got a job, got an income, that we have to provide more rental opportunities for those people. And at the moment, you know, we, there just isn't enough. And we don't, everyone recognizes the problem, but we don't have the coalition of actors that can solve it. And 
a part of that is financing. So the private sector, and this is a discussion that I've had with Cascovadia from the Banking Council, that if you look at the finance charter, that that should have been the mechanism to bring a lot, billions and billions and billions of rands onto the table to catalyze that kind of investment. I think politically that opportunity is still there. Our current minister is out to lunch, so it's not going to happen before 2019. But, um, you know, the, the pieces of the puzzle are obviously are all clearly on the table, and it is totally doable. Um, and I'm pretty sure that through the Banking Council you can get most of the financial institutions to play ball as well. Okay, we've got a, another question over here. Um, two concerns. Ah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Two concerns. Um, I heard you speaking about transportation, and I was not here for for most of your um, for most of that part. Uh, but I I want to speak about how train. I think it's the one system that is really not making sense to me because I feel like if it's not beneficial to the poor, then why is it there? Because I feel like I'm middle class and it's still overpriced for me. So I would want you to take me through that, please. Secondly, you spoke about communication and engagement. Um, as a black activist, I, I, I have to say that we cannot keep preaching to ourselves. Um, you know, we, we have these engagements, these dialogues, and our white counterparts are never there. And, and I'm talking about white young people. And, and, and I don't know if it's arrogance or disinterest, but we keep speaking about you know, things or things of national importance, and they're, they're never there. I mean, I was in Verse the other day, and we, we were speaking about land, and I saw this one white guy in a full room of black people um, engaging on how do we get back the land that mm-hmm. we should rightfully get back. Mm-hmm. So my question is, what are we then to do if our white counterpart are just not interested? Thank you. Sure. So on how train, uh, how train um, okay, on how train, um, tricky issue, right? So, um, so firstly, the the sort of obvious answer would be to say terrible disaster, middle class conceit. Um, we should never have done it. We should have used the money to fix Prasa and get the train between Soweto and downtown to be safe and have renew that stock and so on and so on. So that will be the sort of easy answer. Um, and uh, cocktail wasn't that good for me to slip into a populist mode yet, so I'll give you uh, the more complicated answer. Um, so, so Gauteng is the largest economic hub on the continent. And it is the only global city region that is part of the sort of global economy as an anchoring point in that. So it is, and there's, as I said earlier, it's the larger conurbation, there's 12 to 13 million people here. So that scale economy, the complexity of the economy, what Santa needs, what Centurion needs, what Pretoria needs, what the downtown needs, the how train makes complete sense. Okay? That said, that said, the way that it was done was criminal because what we were able to do is to allow private developers and concessionaires to take up to, I think the last count, about 28 to 32 billion rand and on top of that have a profit guarantee arrangement for 10 years. Right? So they can't lose money. The concessionaire can't lose money. Okay? And that is all public money. So how you justify that when people lose their lives surfing on the trains from Soweto into town? Right? How? You can't. You can't. It's clearly profoundly unjust. So how do you square these things? You can't. There's no neat squaring of it. So, comes back to current discussion. 
what has happened is at the same time, we've had a commitment of a 32 billion recapitalization program for Prasa. We all know what has happened to the bulk of that money. The wrong guys ordered the wrong trains. They arrived. They were kind of didn't work. They were too high. Uh, we lost a couple of billion because of inefficiencies. Secondly, a large chunk of that have been pilfered in other ways. And so the recap program of the normal trains that ordinary people use in our cities has been stalled effectively by 10 years. And it might just be too late because of the amount of damage that has been done to the system and most importantly, people's trust in the system. So that's a very complicated story. So it's not that we didn't invest there. We did, but we pilfered the money in a different way. In this way, we gave a completely unfair competitive advantage to very wealthy companies, and in this way, we mismanaged the resources. So that's sort of on the money side and the investment. The real problem, though, is that we've got a subsidy regime in this country where the buses get a half a billion per annum irrespective of the quality of the service. Half a billion. We spend a total of almost 50 billion on subsidies across all the modes in all nine provinces in the country. And the service deteriorates year on year. So there's a profound and massive governance problem at the core of it linked to an institutional problems because national government and a parastatal runs the rail, another parastatal runs how train, provincial companies run the buses, and then no one gives money to the minibus taxis, right, except for some recap. So you've got to fix that governance problem so that you can pull the money and say, in an urban city region like Gauteng, how do you make multiple modes of mobility work most efficiently and in a way that the poor can have their mobility subsidized and they can have a safe and a reliable system? That's the core question. So that could mean that how train gets extended as they're planning. Could mean that. But only then if there's a guaranteed subsidy system for certain categories of travelers who deserve that subsidy because they can't afford those prices. So the point that I'm trying to make is that you can have a specific response to how train that can be unambiguous where you can be outraged and you should be. But actually, the larger question of how we move and how we create a mobility system that can optimize the urban, uh, the overall functioning of the urban conurbation so that all categories of settlement and all people in the city can thrive, we haven't answered that. And interestingly enough, there's no political pressure. No one is mobilizing around that. No one is talking about it, which takes me to your second question. I obviously don't have a direct answer because I don't know the specific context you're speaking about. But in my view, if we are talking about interracial or cross-racial or cross-class dialogues and debates, if those discussions are in the realm of deliberation and divorced from any concrete practice-related activity, I think it's a recipe for disaster. So I think the only way we are going to find mechanisms to speak meaningfully, to both black and white learn, to build new vocabularies, new languages, to learn to listen, is if we also do stuff together that matters to both of us. And it is in the doing, in the praxis, that we are then able to build a different footing for a transactional relationship where you can ask the harder questions and you can have the arguments and the fights. Because what sustains you is not just a commitment to dialogue, but what sustains you is a shared practice and trying to fix something in the real world. And I think that that has to be an underpinning if we want to have transformative conversations. And, you know, my sense is that a lot of the conversations we as black people have is in a lexicon and in a vocabulary that in a way makes us feel very secure and confident in our rage and in our anger and in our absolute sense of, of frustration with a lack of transformation. But at the same time, it is consoling because it allows us to remain with ourselves, to remain collective in our anger and in our outrage, but not to kind of do the uncomfortable work of also 
doing stuff together and admitting we our own conversations and dialogue, we, we have blind spots, right? So I'm not saying that that means that it's our problem that white people are not joining the conversation. That's not what I'm saying at all. All I am suggesting is that there are ways in which we can deploy language that can, in a sense, build a self-referential conversation. And certainly in the context of Cape Town and with my colleagues at the University of Cape Town in the Black Academic Caucus, I've had lots of these conversations where there's been an insistence in a kind of a vocabulary as opposed to a substantive conversation. I'm not saying that's what you're doing at all. I'm just reflecting on the back of your question what some of my experience has been.